I'm, I'm told that I have uh, the name of this institution uh, not quite correct, and I followed that. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, actually, uh, this is a, a, from a, a, a paper that hasn't appeared yet, uh, honoring uh, Professor Helena Rachielka, uh the uh, uh, Polish logician that they're uh, producing a uh, volume in her honor now. She died some years ago now. But it's uh, showing that parallel to the, the structure of a number of familiar modal logics, there are sub uh, logics of classical first order logic where the quantifier rules match the modal rules. So if you don't understand what all of that means, uh, let me talk for a while. And then if you don't understand what that means, uh, we have a problem. This is a quote from uh, Georg von Rick, uh, which uh, in some ways is an early observation of this. But uh, we want to look at the details. Uh, so what, what I'll show you is a number of uh, classical, of uh, sublogics of classical logic. Uh, and the question, in part is where do quantifiers and modalities diverge? What's, what's the essential difference between them? I mean, in some sense, if you know Kripke semantics, you can think of uh, modal operators as quantifying over possible worlds, you know, boxes for all accessible possible worlds. So it's like a universal quantifier, but where does the difference lie? Uh, okay, are we going to have problems here? Uh, so, okay, so that's what I just said. All right, so the, the basics here, uh, just, this, just to set the, the, the notation, uh, I'll assume uh, the standard propositional connectives, I'll assume both box and diamond. Uh, at the first order level, I'll assume uh, we have quantifiers but not modal operators. Uh, variables, but I won't bother with constants or function symbols. Uh, the, generally speaking, I'll take diamond as uh, defined from box this way and exists as defined from all this way. So I don't have to give quite so many rules or axioms. Uh, so uh, also uh, some uh, simplifications. Uh, when, when doing first order logic, you, you uh, usually work uh, with a, a domain and a valuation or uh, some alternative terminology that assigns members of the domain to the free variables of your formula. And that's, that's fine, but it's, it's a kind of a, a nuisance. And so what I'll do is just write members of the domain into the formulas themselves. Uh, so kind of a pseudo formula that just says instead of x whose value is a, I'll just write a. Uh, so understood that way, for all x, phi of x is true in a domain D if phi is true for each thing in the domain. Uh, technically, this isn't a formula, but as long as we all understand how it's used, that's, that's fine. Uh, okay. Now, the thing is, box and for all certainly have some very obvious similarities. Uh, you have a rule of necessitation from x conclude box x. You have a rule of uni universal generalization from x conclude for all x. Uh, but uh, where if the question is, what are these things peculiar to quantifiers? Uh, they have uh, variables associated with them. Modal operators don't. And we'll see what that does. Now, um, I'll, I'll be using this kind of familiar and formal notation. If I write phi of x and later on phi of y, y is the result of replacing free occurrences of x uh, by y. Uh, and there's some technical stuff here that I, you're probably all familiar with, but just to establish the, the terminology, y is free for x in a formula if no free occurrence of x is in the scope of a quantifier y. So it means uh, Substituting y's for x's isn't going to accidentally bind anything. Uh, and this notion of similarity, um, I want to work with the notion of quantification. And if change of variable uh, isn't going to hurt, you can think of them as really being the same formula where one is in disguise. 
So here's a formal definition of that. If x and y are different variables, phi of x and phi of y are similar, and other terminology has been used as well. If y is free for x in phi of x, and phi of x has no free occurrences of y. Now, that that uh, looks a little asymmetric, but in fact it isn't. Uh, if phi of x and phi of y are similar, phi of y and phi of x are similar, so it's a symmetric relation. Uh, it's a transitive relation. Uh, so essentially I won't distinguish between similar uh, formulas. They, they all express the same things. Uh, and uh, in, in any standard treatment of first order classical logic, if phi of x and phi of y are similar, for all x phi of x and for all y phi of y can be proved equivalent if you're in an axiom system, can be deduced equivalent if you're using a, a, a sequent calculus, have the same truth value if you're working semantically. So whatever you're working in, these will work out the same. But the thing is, I'm going to be working with very weak systems. Uh, and you don't have the machinery to prove that uh, equivalence. Uh, oh, this is a reference to where all that is defined. So what I'm going to do is, is take similar formulas behave uh, equivalently uh, uh, as a basic, one of our basic axioms. Um, all right. So with that out of the way, um, this is the thing that will be assuming in all of our logics. If phi of x and phi of y are similar, for all x phi x is equivalent to for all y phi of y. And I probably don't have to mention this again. Okay. Uh, but what this does say is our analog of box is going to be universal quantification and not universal quantification with a particular variable. Uh, one could make some sense out of an analogy uh, with a particular variable in there, too. But you would really want some kind of multimodal logic, multi-agent logic, essentially one for each variable. So I'm not doing that. It's just the analog is with universal quantification, period. Okay. So uh, what I want to do is start uh, with the most natural, simple uh, modal and quantifier systems. Uh, so, normal modal logics. And this uh, you're probably all familiar with. So, uh, axiomatically, tautologies, box distributes over implication, sometimes called the K axiom. You have as rules uh, modus ponens and necessitation. Uh, these are understood to be axiom schemes, not particular axioms. So uh, that, that much, I'll come back to it in a minute, but that much axiomatizes the logic called K, this, the smallest normal modal logic. The first order analogs of that, well, you have the similarity axiom, which is always there in the background. Tautologies, universal quantification distributes over uh, implication, uh, modus ponens, and universal instantiation. So this is an exact parallel. Uh, so the, the definitions, the modal logic you saw is the smallest normal modal logic. It's called K. Uh, so the quantificational system you just saw, uh, it's a subsystem of first, full first order logic. I'll call it QK, the, the analog of K. So here, here they are in parallel. Uh, this is what makes up K, and this is what makes up QK. There's that extra similarity thing, but otherwise they match up exactly. Uh, here are some uh, sample theorems. In K, uh, box distributes over AND. In QK, for all, distributes over AND. and if you take uh, any standard proof of this in K and just replace the boxes by for alls, you will get a proof of that. Uh, box doesn't distribute over an or, but box X or Y does imply uh, either one of them is possible or the other is necessary. Uh, well, in the same way, for all doesn't distribute over or, but if you have for all X uh, a disjunction, Either one of them is existential or the other is universal and it's holding. 
And again, you take a, any proof you've seen of this, uh, you'll get a proof of that by just replacing boxes by for um, And by the way, using the similarity axiom oh, that, uh, uh, that for, for all distributes over implies also gives you this where y and z have suitable freeness properties. I'm just mentioning that in passing. But non-theorems. Well, uh, this is a non-theorem. For all x implies exists x. You should kind of expect it to be a non-theorem because in k you don't have box implies diamond. Uh, the question is how would you show it's a non-theorem of qk? because failing to derive it is not good enough. Uh, uh, quantifiers don't commute. That's a little curious. Uh, in a little while, I'll verify these aren't provable. But you understand, in order to show something is provable, and that you have an axiom system, you give a proof. To show something is not provable, typically you provide a semantics, and then provide a model where it fails. We're going to need a semantics. Uh, here are some more examples. Uh, okay, that, that uh, is one of the axioms. Uh, this, which is the analog of uh, box and implication, implies diamond, implies diamond, which is a theorem of K. Uh, this one, uh, universal instantiation, uh, for all X, this implication implies that, doesn't hold. And by the way, there, there is no, I, 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 the analog for this uh, in the, the modal case would be something like box X implies X. You've lost a box. Uh, but this doesn't hold. Uh, oh, I was afraid of that. Uh, <laughs> my apologies. Uh, my hearing aid is telling me it's, the battery is going to go in about 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, Anyway, uh, let's see, this one, uh, all A's are B's, all B's are C's, implies all A's are C's, uh, that's provable. Uh, this one, which is uh, a little more horrendous, uh, it's, a, it's a version of if a horse is an animal, then the head of a horse is a head of an animal. Uh, H is head, A is animal, and uh, T of X, Y is uh, X is on top of Y, and X is the head of Y. So uh, if uh, for all x, x is a horse implies x is an animal, so if a horse is, all horses are animals, then whatever it is you're talking about, if there's something that's, uh, that x is the head of, uh, and that something is a horse, then there's something that x is the head of, and that something is an animal. Now, this is not uh, This is the same thing, except that you, outside for all x has been dropped and I've instantiated this instead. You see there's an S there and there. So if all horses are animals, and if this particular thing S is the head of a horse, then this particular thing S is the head of an animal. Uh, yeah, okay, so I'm reading that here. This head of a horse is the head of an animal. Uh, that one is provable. So the differences are a little subtle here. Uh, okay, but before we get to semantics, there are some obvious extensions. Just as you start with modal K, uh, you can build it up to D, to T, to K4, and so on. So, uh, some extensions here. KD uh, is box implies diamond. Uh, so, QD will be for all implies exists, added to QK. Uh, KT is box X implies X. Uh, QKT is instantiation for all X phi of X implies phi of anything that's free for X. Uh, and axiomatically, what, what we've got now is three subsystems of classical logic, uh, except we know they are subsystems. We don't know these are proper yet, uh, that QK is different than QKD and so on. For that, we need to be able to prove some unprovability results. Um, so now it's time to look at semantics. Uh, okay, let's let's start with the modal case, which is the most familiar. Uh, 
this is uh, a standard uh, Kripke model. That's the model. You have possible worlds. You have an accessibility relation. And you have a notion of uh, something being true at a world. Uh, uh, truth at a world at the atomic level is just arbitrarily specified. That's part of saying what a model is. Uh, Non-atomic truth uh, at each world and behaves truth table wise and so on. The, the main thing is uh, the way modal operators behave. And here's the, the, the standard thing. Uh, box x is true at a world gamma if uh, x is true at any delta that's accessible from gamma. So it's the familiar uh, box x is true at a world if x is true at all accessible worlds. And then you get different modal logics by putting different conditions on the accessibility relation. Uh, Okay, so theorems of K are valid in all models like this. Theorems of KD are valid in all models with serial accessibility, which also has other names, but what it means is any world has some world accessible from it. Uh, theorems of KT are valid in all models where accessibility is reflexive. Okay, so what I want is analogs for these quantificational uh, uh, logics. Now, in a modal model, when you move to an accessible world, you move from necessary truth to truth. If box X is true at a world, and you move to an accessible world, you're at a world where X is true. You've lost the box. Uh, so it's kind of a, a move to an accessible world is a kind of a denecessitation. Uh, I want models in which moving to an accessible world drops a quantification, which in, in, in effect is doing an instantiation. So moving to an accessible world should instantiate your universe and quantifiers. OK, so uh, QK models. All right, so it's all got a little more structure than before. Uh, the uh, possible worlds and accessibility are as before. Uh, the, the, the new thing uh, is uh, this, which is a domain function. Uh, and it's. Uh, a varying domain function. It maps uh, possible worlds to non-empty sets. Uh, I'm assuming it's monotonic, so if you move to a, an accessible world, everything you had, you still have. Uh, the rest of this is the same forcing. Uh, uh, the truth at a world condition is arbitrary. Uh, that's part of your definition of a model. And beyond that, you calculate truth at worlds. So Boolean connectives behave in the usual fashion at each world. Uh, but uh, we, we need to define what it means for a formula phi to be true at gamma in such a model. Uh, and all the conditions are exactly as they are in the modal case, except what's the quantifier condition look like. Um, so, Phi here is a first-order formula, no free variables, but it can contain members of the domain. I said before I would put members of the domain into formulas. Uh, the, the domain of the model is uh, it just lump all the domains of the worlds together. So members of the domain can appear in a formula, even if they're not in the, the, the world that you're evaluating the formula in. So we can. Standard example, we can talk about Pegasus in this world, even though he doesn't exist in this world. Uh, so the question is, how is this to behave? Uh, at the atomic level, it's arbitrary. You have the Boolean conditions. And this is the quantifier condition. For all x, phi of x is true at gamma. If well, what I uh, want to say is every instance of it is true at every accessible world. So uh, for every delta that's accessible from gamma, and for everything in the domain of delta, phi of that thing is true at delta. Okay. So you've lost a quantifier and instead gained instantiations. But the instantiations are local because different worlds can have different domains. Uh, OK, the, uh, I define exists to be not for all not. And what this gives you is exists x, phi of x is true at gamma. 
if there's some accessible world and something in the domain that this formula is true of at that world. So there's actually two sums here. There's some accessible world and there's something in that domain. Okay, uh, truth for a formula is with free variables as a derivative notion and we won't need it very much, uh, but uh, I'll say a formula with free variables is true at a, a world if each instance available at that world is true there. A formula is valid uh, in a model if it is true at each of the possible worlds. Okay, so now we have a semantics. Uh, this semantics for QK. So QK has no special conditions on the accessibility of the ocean. A QD model uh, will require ser seriality. Every world has a world accessible uh, from it. QT uh, will require a reflexive, exactly like D and T. Um, and we've got notions of validity for that. So, uh, all right, well, so I, let, let's start here. Uh, first, let me show you an example of a validity argument. Uh, the, for all x, phi implies psi. Well, okay, that for all distributes across an implication. I want to show that's valid. So, suppose you have a model and a world in it where this isn't true. So this fails at gamma. Uh, well, then the antecedent is true at gamma. But this antecedent, this antecedent is true, but that consequent is false. Um, because this is false, there has to be an accessible world and something in that world that makes psi false there. Uh, so for some delta uh, and, and something in the domain of delta, psi of c fails at, at delta. But for all x, this implication is true at gamma. So at delta, every instance available at delta has to be true, because delta is accessible. So phi of c implies psi of c is true. Same thing for all x, phi of x. Every instance has to be true at every accessible world. So phi of c is true at delta. So at delta, you've got phi of c implies psi of c, and you've got phi of c. So you've got psi of c. But up there you didn't, so this is a contradiction. So there can't be a world where this, this uh, implication fails. So that's an argument for, the, for its validity. Um, and in fact, uh, you can easily verify that all of the QK axioms are valid, that the rules preserve validity, and so you've got a soundness result. Anything provable is, is valid. Um, So that's the soundness side. Uh, and you can do the same thing with QT, D and QT. Uh, seriality and uh, uh, reflexivity give you exactly what you need. Uh, we don't need completeness yet. If I can show you a QK model where something fails, then it can't be provable in QK. Soundness is enough for that. So uh, here's, here's a very simple example. And it's an example you probably all know. Take a, a one-world model uh, with nothing accessible to it. It's not even accessible to itself. Uh, then at that model, at that world rather, this is true, uh, but the existential is not. Let's see, why is this true? Uh, because show me an accessible world where the, an instance fails. There aren't any accessible worlds, so the universal quantification is true. But to show you how the existential, you would have to have an accessible world and an instance that held. Uh, this is, in a, in a modal case, this is essentially the same way you show uh, box doesn't imply diamond uh, in K. You just take a one world model with no accessibility holding. Uh, all right, so um, for all x phi implies exists x phi is not provable in QK. Uh, here's a QD example. Uh, this is a little more complicated. Uh, so remember in QD, every world has to have some world accessible from it. So gamma has delta, delta has omega, omega has itself. I'm not assuming transitivity here. 
uh, but this makes it a QD frame. Uh, you have, each world has to have a domain associated with it. Uh, for that, it's A. For this, it's AB. For this, it's ABC. Uh, so we've got monotonicity. Uh, and I want to specify which formulas are true and which are false at the atomic level, and that'll finish defining the model. Um, Okay, so I'm only looking at a one two-place relation symbol. Uh, so P uh, of A, A, B, A, C, B, A, B, 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 C all hold here. In other words, uh, A and B are related to anything at this world, but C is not. Uh, well, that makes both of these true here. Uh, for all Y, P of A, Y is true here because every instance of it down here is true. This is the only world accessible from this. The same thing for the other one. Uh, and that makes for all x, for all y, p of x, y, true up there, because every instance of it down here uh, is true. There are only the a and the b instances, and we just verified those. So at gamma, that's true. P of CB is not true down here. I left it out of the things that are true, and so I'm putting it in the false column now. Uh, these two don't really matter. Do anything you want with them. Uh, that means this is false here, because if it were true, every instance of it would have to be true down here, but this instance isn't. So this one fails here. And then this one fails up here, same sort of argument. So you see what you've got. For all x, for all y is true here, but for all y, for all x is false here. So your quantifiers don't commute. All right. So this is not provable in QT. Uh, it's also not provable in QT, but you have to fuss with the model a little. I'll leave that to you. You can turn in the papers when you leave. Um, so what about completeness? Uh, okay, I assume you've all seen proofs of completeness for axiomatic modal logics. Uh, what you do is construct a canonical model. Uh, in it, uh, your possible worlds are all your maximally consistent sets. Uh, to define the accessibility relation for each possible world, that is for each maximally consistent set, uh, each gamma, define a gamma sharp to be all the x's that are necessary at gamma. So just, uh, and then accessibility, uh, delta is accessible from gamma if gamma sharp is, accessible, is a subset of delta. So that defines an accessibility relation. At the atomic level, uh, take P to be true at gamma if it's one of the formulas in gamma. And then the standard result is the truth lemma. In the model that I just defined, uh, a formula of any sort works out to be true at gamma exactly when it's a member of gamma. Most of the steps of that are uh, very simple. There's one that requires some work, and uh, I don't think I Put it, yeah, I didn't put it on the slides here. Uh, if you've seen it, fine. If you haven't seen it, take my word for it. Uh, all right, but so since this thing winds up being a model, uh, if x is not provable, there's a maximally consistent set that leaves it out. And that's also a possible world, and it will be false at that possible world in the model. So that's, that's the, how you prove completeness. Um, well, completeness for QK is along the same lines with some fussing. Uh, but we need Henkin witnesses. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with the, the, the term, uh, exists x phi of x. Suppose I have that. Uh, OK, let's introduce a C to be something having the property phi. So we'll introduce C and say phi holds of it. And that's called the Henkin witness to the existential quantum. Um, so we'll need those. So take the language we had and add 
new variables, because the ones we have are already used for things. Uh, these are going to be uh, variables for <coughs> serving as Henkin witnesses. I'll call them parameters. And I'll make the point of I'll never quantify them. So, in effect, they don't look like constants to the, the outside world. Um, okay, so there's one, one condition here. Uh, before it was just maximally consistent sets. Now you have these parameters running around the place. And you want to make sure no uh, one of your maximally consistent sets uses up all the parameters. You want to always have more for other worlds. So uh, a possible world now is going to be a maximally consistent set of formulas in this logic QK that leaves out infinitely many parameters. That's, that's it. So it's just like before, maximally consistent. It can involve parameters, but it has to omit infinitely many of them. Um, so uh, as the, associated with each uh, of these possible worlds, we have to have a domain, and that's going to be the set of parameters that turn up there. Uh, we need to say which atomic formulas are true at which worlds. Well, I'll say an atomic formula is true at a world if it's one of the members of it, exactly like in the modem case. Uh, we need, ex uh, oh, did I, I, I left out the definition of uh, accessibility. Let's see. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's here. I just may have gone past it. I did leave it out. Uh, I, last night, I uh, rearranged some of the slides. So I'm sorry, I must have taken this one out. So I assume you can all make it up for yourselves. Uh, now, uh, the, the, the definition is really very simple. Uh, remember that sharp operation. So uh, you drop boxes. Well, dropping a box now becomes instantiation. So. Uh, Delta is accessible from gamma if for every universally quantified formula in gamma, all of its delta instances uh, are in delta. So all of the instances of that formula that involve parameters of delta are actually in delta. So it's the exact parallel of the uh, sharp operation I just had for this. <coughs> All right, so with all of that, uh, we have a, what's called the QK canonical model. And again, exactly like before, you can pr prove a truth lemma. Truth at a world is equivalent to being one of the formulas in the set that makes up the world. Uh, it's, it's almost the same as uh, the modal proof. And I'm, I'm, skip the details, partly because I skipped the modal details. Uh, but now the ex existential step, uh, when a universally quantified thing isn't true at a world, there has to be an alternate world where that formula fails, uh, an, an instance of that formula fails. Uh, that will involve the introduction of a Henkin constant. This is why you always needed some extra ones around. So. If a universally quantified formula isn't in a set, you can create an alternative set where an instance of it fails. All right, so that gives you completeness for QK. And in the same way, you can get completeness for uh, uh, these. Are, it says KD and KT. It should be Q, Q, uh, D and QT. Uh, all right. So what about full? first order logic. And by the way, I'm going to go in both directions. Right now we're going up to full first order logic and then I'm going to go down to simpler logics. But what about full uh, first order logic? We started with QK, QD extends that, QT extends that, and we've seen enough non-provable things to verify that these are proper extensions. 
Uh, what more do we need to get full first order logic? Anybody want to guess at an axiom? Okay, so the question is, what do you need to get the Hinkin completeness proof to actually work in its usual way? Um, okay, we've got Hinkin witnesses for existential statements, but if a universally quantified formula fails at a world, uh, you'll have a counter uh, instance, not at that world, but at an accessible world. So you've changed worlds. Uh, and what, what we need is some way of those witnesses accumulating. So if you're at this world and this universally quantified formula fails, you move to another world, you get a, an instance uh, where that fails. But now you have this other universally quantified formula, so you have to move to a different world to get a counterexample for that. And what you're doing is creating a chain of worlds. What you need is some way of taking a limit of that chain so you can accumulate everything you've done. Uh, the, the, the trouble is when you move from a world to an accessible world, formulas get lost. Remember, you move from gamma to, the, to gamma sharp. <coughs> you, you, you drop some formulas. Um, what you need is formulas not to get lost. Uh, if gamma forces x, if x is true at gamma, and you move to an accessible world delta, you'll still have x. So you need something to guarantee these formulas accumulate as you keep moving from world to world. So that's the essential difference between the modal case and uh, the, the quantifier case. Um, and uh, it's semantically, but here, modal operators always do something. If you put a box on a formula, it has an effect. Quantifiers don't always do something. They're vacuous quantifiers. They don't, they don't do anything. That's exactly what you need. Uh, vacuous quantification, uh, it, phi implies for all x phi, provided x is not free in phi. It's a vacuous quantifier. For all x phi will be, for all intents and purposes, the same as phi. So this is the axiom you need to add. If you add this to QK, QT, QD, you get full first order logic. Um, the corresponding modal axiom, of course, will trivialize modal logic. So, uh, why does it give you the accumulation property? Well, that's very simple. Suppose uh, gamma forces phi and gamma is related to delta. Uh, well, this is from the slide that I left out. What it says is, uh, if delta is accessible from gamma, then anything that's, uh, uh, then what you want is all the universally quantified things here instantiated with things from the domain of delta uh, are here. Um, well, since x is not free in phi, and phi is, I assumed, something in gamma, uh, and we have this as an axiom, this is vacuous quantification, uh, for all x phi will be in gamma. When you move to delta, you lose the quantifier, but it didn't do anything anyway, so you have phi and delta. It's, it's exactly this that gives you the uh, uh, accumulation you need. So with that, uh, the usual Hankin completeness proof works. Uh, do it in, say, QT, uh, plus vacuous quantific quantification. Construct the canonical modal model, uh, sorry, the, the canonical possible worlds model. Uh, if X is not provable, there'll be some member where it, is, it does not occur. Uh, Enumerate all the universal quantifiers. This begins to look like the Hankin completeness proof. But instead of adding them to your set, what you're doing is moving from world to world to world. These are the, all the universally quantified ones. Okay, you're at this world where you don't have x. Move to a world that falsifies q1. From there, move to a world that falsifies q2, and so on. Uh, and then take a limit. 
what you can do now. Uh, so this is the sequence that successively falsifies things. Um, and uh, okay, that defines that. Then, then uh, you can take the limit, and that uh, that won't be your proper counter model. So uh, I'm leaving the, the the details out here. But uh, so in effect, vacuous quantification is exactly the thing you need. It. Uh, So, as I said, this is the, the usual construction, but kind of in disguise. Um, and, you know, the, the vacuous quantification seems like a kind of sometimes trivial, sometimes a nuisance, but it's the essential thing here. Okay. Uh, other proof procedures. Um, I showed you axiom systems. Uh, if you've seen tableau systems for modal logics, you should be able to invent them for these uh, uh, quantified logics. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to show them here, but uh, the paper is on my website if you want to see them. But it's exactly what you would think. Take the, the modal rules. Every place you do something with a box, do the same thing with the universal quantifier. You'll get tableau systems for these logics. And what that gives you along the way is uh, you take the uh, one way of showing the modal logic K is decidable is to show any tableau construction has to terminate and either you'll have a proof or you'll have enough information to get a counter model. Exactly the same thing works for QK. So that's a decidable logic. Um, this is not quite true. I don't know if it's true. It's cert I don't know about QT. But I said here it's, it holds for QD, but in fact, I don't know about QD either. I don't know at what point you get to undecidability coming along. Uh, you can use modal tableaus to prove interpolation uh, theorems. Well, you can use these quantifier tableaus to prove interpolation theorems here. So each of these sublogics of first order logic has interpolation, interpolation. OK, so we've gone up to classical logic, full, full classical logic. What about going in the other direction? Well, you know, what's simpler than K? Um, I, I don't know. Generally, these days, people tend to concentrate on normal modal logics. But there are families of logics weaker than normal modal logics. Um, the, 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 the first one that comes along is what's called the regular logics. Um, for K, you have this rule of necessitation. <coughs> for uh, in, Instead, we'll drop that and use this, which is called the rule of regularity. Uh, it's, it's strictly weaker than necessitation. Uh, we'll still keep the axiom box x implies y implies box x implies y. Uh, if you have necessitation, this is a derived rule. But if you have this, that is not a derived rule. But the derivation will use that distributivity axiom. Uh, so the weakest regular modal logic is called C. It's the analog of K. Uh, so this is an axiomatization of uh, C. So the difference is in this rule here. Uh, in C, you can still prove box distributes over an AND, but there are no theorems that are that say something is necessary. Uh, in particular, truth is not necessary as a, a provable thing. Uh, If, if, in fact, if you had this, C would collapse to K. Because if X is a theorem, so is T implies X. By regularity, so is box T implies box X. If you had box T, you'd have box X. You'd have the, the, uh, the, the usual rule. 
but that's not a proof that this is not provable. Uh, we need the semantics for that. Uh, among his early papers, Saul Kripke gave us semantics for uh, these regular logics. Uh, the uh, possible worlds and accessibility uh, and truth of the world generally are the same, but you have this uh, collection N. Uh, he called them, uh, he, he worked with the, the complement of it and called them queer worlds. Here I'm working with this and called them, calling them normal worlds. Uh, if you're a Graham Priest fan, uh, the, you'd be talking about non-standard uh, non, non or non-classical worlds or something like that. But uh, N is supposed to be the worlds where things behave the way you're used to, and everywhere else they behave peculiarly. Uh, so you have this set N, and if N is all of G, this will just be the, your standard K models. But uh, the thing is uh, about how uh, box behaves. Uh, so this says if you're at a normal wor world, uh, box behaves normally. It's true if uh, the unbox thing is true at all accessible worlds. Uh, if you're at a non-normal world, well very simply everything is possible and nothing is necessary. You don't even have to look at the structure of it. It's just all possible statements are true, all necessary statements are false. Um, okay. uh, one can prove soundness and completeness for these by an absolutely straightforward variation of the usual soundness and completeness proofs. And one can give tableau systems for them. Uh, again, since I didn't show you the, the tableau systems for normal logics, I won't show you these either, but uh, they're, they're again straightforward. Uh, so, what about uh, quantifier analogs for that? What you would do is drop universal quantification and put this in. So, this is QC, it's a quantified analog of, of C. Uh, you can define QC models in the expected way. You have all of the structures of the uh, QK models, except you also have this set of normal worlds. Uh, so the, 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 the conditions would be uh, at, uh, at normal worlds, it's the same definition we had before. And at non-normal worlds, uh, all existential statements are true and all universal statements are false. No boxes, but all diamonds. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this, this isn't an, an example where I'm going to do anything with it, just to show you what it's like. So uh, A and B are, are just you know, predicate letters here, and T is uh, a tautology, just, just any tautology will do, just we'll say it's this one. Uh, so here's a, a, a three-world model. Um, the arrows indicate accessibility, and uh, you have reflexivity, so each world is uh, accessible to itself. And I've shown you the uh, uh, domains of each world. Uh, the blue ones are normal, and the whatever that is, magenta, uh, are not normal. Um, okay, since uh, T of X is a tautology. Uh, T of A is true uh, up there. Uh, T of A and T of B are true here and also true here. That tautologies evaluate without bothering about the quantifier rules. Um, okay. okay, so up there at the top, for all X, T of X is true because uh, all instances are true at each accessible world. That's here and here, and both you have T of A and T of B. Uh, down here, for all X, T of X is true uh, because 
all instances are true in all accessible worlds because this is the only accessible world. Over here, not for all x, g of x uh, is true because it's not a normal world, so universal statement quantified things are, are not true. Uh, over here, uh, this implication is true because the, the uh, consequent is true. Uh, up there, uh, let's see, why is that implication true? Because the consequent is true. Down here, uh, this implication is true because the antecedent is false. I never, uh, uh, I never said be held of anything. Uh, all right, that, that was just to give you some feeling for how these things are evaluated. Um, one can go a, a little further in this direction. You can add this to the regular version. Uh, you can add this. Uh, for Q, for the D version, you have you uh, on sem the semantics you assume seriality. For the T version, reflexivity. But again, you have you allow non-normal words. The soundness and completeness proofs carry over, no problem. Um, and there are tableau systems for these, and there are interpolation theorems for these. Uh, so. We've got this structure so far. Q is first order classical logic, and then various sublogics of it, the lattice of them. Those are the analogs of the normal ones. These are the analogs of the regular ones. Uh, so some of these are known to be decidable. Q is known not to be. Some of them are uh, unknown. Uh, all of them have in the, the interpolation property. Uh, okay, the question is, can this be pushed even further down? Uh, are there quantifier analogs of still weaker modal logics? Uh, well, yeah, there's, there are neighborhood models there are, uh, where uh, thing, things get, get weaker yet. Uh, I'm not going to, to show you these, but yes, there are analogs of the quantifi quantificational versions uh, an analogous, analogous to uh, uh, modal logics for which you need the neighborhood semantics. Uh, I have something I have no idea about. Can you find analogs of these things if your your base is intuitionistic logic? I have no idea. What you'd have to look at, I suppose, are intuitionistic modal logics. And okay, so such things exist, but. Uh, I've, n I've not seen any analog, maybe that's out there, but I haven't seen any analog of, uh, intuitionistic analog of regular logics, just intuitionistic normal modal logics. Um, but, you know, can, can, are there natural sublogics of first order intuitionistic logic along the lines that I just showed you? I don't know. Um, I, I've been treating quantification and not quantifiers. There, there's a distinction. Uh, remember I said if you change variables, uh, it was essentially the same thing. But what if you want to treat a for all x and a for all y as really distinct things? The analog would be you have a box x, a box y, and two agents, a multi-agent modal logic. Uh, I believe an analysis like this could be done for that too, but I haven't, I haven't looked at it. Uh, these are interchangeable under the right <coughs> conditions, but if you started doing that, you would get logics where they weren't. Uh, and let's see. Be this is not the end. Uh, th there's one more remark to make, uh, and that is um, classical first order logic. Uh, has a nice algebraic semantics. Modal logics have an algebraic semantics. Can the uh, algebraic semantics for modal logics give any clue to what an algebraic semantics for these sublogics of classical logic would look like? I have no idea about that either. 
but okay, that, thank you. Thank you.